You know people associate you with cars, but I would like to start by asking you, what do you say you do, or how would you describe your career yourself? What are you? Um, I think I'm a missionary, basically. You know, I've, uh, I've promoted design, and I've promoted the rise of design uh, within companies. And uh, uh, very much so, this has been really one of my f uh, fundamental goals. And um, I'm pleased to see that uh, in many ways this has uh, succeeded. And when I see the, the role uh, that designers uh, have today, when uh, you know, and I compare it to the times when I began, it's it's really uh, you know, many different. So I, I was uh, thinking that you know when I left uh, Renault, I I um, I was contacted by the uh, Chinese Society of Automobile Engineers, and uh, they they knew that I wouldn't work for a Chinese company because. Uh, uh, in any case, I was outside uh, possibility, and I didn't want to. But what they wanted to ask me to help them is, how do you raise the position of design within corporate, uh, you know, within uh, large companies? And uh, this I did, and in fact, I made eleven trips to China, um, giving conferences and so on and so forth. So yes, that's been my really my life's uh, journey is to, to work on that. Fascinating, a missionary, because I think so often you'll get spoken about and introduced, but I, I always like to find out from the person themselves how they, how they perceive themselves. Okay, well let's take it back to the beginning a little bit, okay? Mm -hmm. Patrick, you're a child, you, you were born in the south of France, in Marseille, um, but then you went to, you came to England um, at the age of 12 um, to study here. You first of all went to London, then to Kent, and... <coughs> Before that, though, I just want to ask you, what type of childhood did you have, and were you always interested in cars? The answer is yes. So, I, um, I was the, the son of uh, a Lieutenant Colonel Doctor in the Foreign Legion, and my mother was English. But uh, I never learned, you know, we never spoke, well, I never learned English until, I, until 12. And in fact, uh, my parents, they spoke in English when they didn't want the children to understand. So, mm -hmm. so, so certainly not the sort of thing one would do today. Um, and um, yes, I loved cars. And, and I, at the time, my father had a, a, a car where half the family or we were quite, uh, quite a few, they were five children. But as we drove, as he drove in France, there weren't that many cars on the road for a start. And there weren't very many different brands, brands. Mm -hmm. and uh, each person was uh, had chosen a brand. So each of you uh, children, and, and then we would count yeah. them off, you know. And being the youngest, they gave me Renault as the the brand, and then this became my favourite brand because I always won. You see, more <laughs> than anything else. What a story. Um, well, we know that you ended up at Renault, but before we get there, you you came to what well, you you came to the UK at the age of twelve, not knowing English, so you had no. a very abrupt um, yeah. learning of the language then, um, and then you ended up uh, in Birmingham at BCU at the age of eighteen. Yes, it's a choice. <laughs> it was definitely a choice. <laughs> well, uh, before I ask you why why Birmingham, why BCU, um, what would 18, 18 year old Patrick have been like? What were you like as an eighteen year old? Well, I remember that um, uh, the, the headmaster of my school, uh, my college, writing to my mother, my mother told me later, that they had made me a prefect because they would rather that I was on their side than against them. So I thought that was... You know, but I, I've always been a relatively timid person, you know. Um, I, was, I played sport, I was a rugby, you know. And in fact, when I was here, I played for the Birmingham Architects. Um, but I was uh, very artistically oriented, I think. You know, I was fascinated by, uh, by, by drawing, and uh, I, I, I drew a lot, even at that period. Um, I don't think I was a brilliant student. Uh, I think it was good at art, for sure. I, I passed my you know, O-levels and A-levels, uh, but um, 
I really needed a bit of problem. <laughs> it didn't come naturally. I became a hard-working guy later. <laughs> so fr from the off, you were interested in cars, particularly yeah. Renault. You were yeah. arty, but you were relatively timid. And then you end up in Birmingham. Why Why Birmingham? Because it was, back then it was called Birmingham College of Arts and Crafts, and one of the colleges that, that then became BCU. Why here? I was fascinated by the Bauhaus, you know, which was really the most important school uh, of the 20th century. And uh, I had read that um, there was a professor in Birmingham who himself had been a very young 23-year-old teacher at the Bauhaus, and whose name was Naum Slutsky. And uh, that was it. And I said, well, uh, I'm going to go to Birmingham uh, because of the Bauhaus, because they had him on the teaching uh, staff. And because it had already, you know, of course, I then inquired, inquired about all the various schools. And clearly Birmingham was one of the best schools in terms of uh, what was then called product design engineering. So, um, yes, and, and I have to say I never regretted it, you know. It was a, I had a very happy uh, period in, in, in Birmingham. And I, I didn't feel, um, I think, I didn't think that I wasted my time any, any week, you know. Every, I felt I was really learning, and so yes, um, that, that's, that's what I can say about So you did product design here, and, yeah. and we've spoken about that you were interested in cars from, from an early age, but why product design? What was it about actually trying to build a car, design a car that interested you? Well, um, yeah, it, it, there wasn't a course on automobile design, and now Slatsky, being a Bauhaus man, um, didn't like anything to do with styling. And in fact, he had a, uh, a bête noire named Raymond Loewy. Uh, you know, Raymond Loewy, the great Franco-American uh, designer, who um, used to say that the best, the best curves are the sales curves, you know, all the nicest curves, something like that. And he felt, down Slatsky, that uh, um, this man was a heretic, you know, that he was just uh, uh, money-oriented and didn't think about design being good for uh, the living and so on and so forth. So you just couldn't mention styling or Raymond Louis, or if so, you had to you know, go out and rinse your mouth and come back. You know? So he certainly wouldn't have spoken to, to us if we didn't mention Raymond Louis. So we forgot about cars. There was a couple of us, three times, no, there were three who liked cars, but we, we uh, drew uh, a way at, in the evening we would compare sketches, but as soon as the teachers would come in, we you know we put everything back <laughs> and hide it. So <laughs> that's the way it was. So it wasn't as straightforward as uh, <laughs> no. as we think it might be. Okay, so take us back to your experience at um, at university. What were the halls that you were walking around like? Give us a flavour of, of of what it looked like, what it felt like. Um. Well, this morning I had a walk through some of the, the shops and I, I thought, I, I felt there was the same sort of spirit. Certainly not the size, uh, and, and probably, and not certainly, the machines were are so far more uh, modern and, uh, and, and uh, adapted to, uh, to, the, to the current uh, needs. But um, I, I studied in a couple of places. <laughs> Uh, three places, in fact, one in Bourneville, one in uh, I think it was in Broad Street, and um, and then of course I went to Gosford Green in the last couple of years, and Gosford Green uh, was just brand new, you know, and we uh, this was uh, for us quite remarkable, uh, but we were not that many students. I think we must have been about hundred, about under ten, so there were ten students probably okay. in product design engineering, and they were all Brits, you know, they were, I was the only. Uh, only in the French world. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a question for you about yeah. that time. So you you were here in the 1960s. Yeah. What car did you have at your aisle then? What what car did you <coughs> like that was on the road? Gracious me. <laughs> uh, well, I, I loved all the um, uh, all the English roadsters, you know, mm -hmm. the MG or or Healy. Um, and these, these, I had all, you know, my eyes were on those. I, lo I, I just love those, uh, those cars. 
and I, I love the, the because probably of my Bauhaus-like mm. teaching, um, the notion of lightness and essential use of material. Uh, what um, Colin Chapman used to, he referred to, um, light is right, you know, and, and so I'm, I'm very much into that. That's why I, I, today I'm a bit difficult with these huge uh, bricks that are, are on the road. But, um, so yes, I was very, very much enamored of these kind of cars. Okay, well, after university, we know that you went on to have, have a lot of success, but it wasn't necessarily as easy to get that first job in the car industry as people might expect. So can you, um, you, knew, you knew what you wanted to go into, which I also want to say a lot of people don't know at that age, do they? You, you, you had your passion, you knew what you wanted to do. But yeah. how did you get that first job? It was very difficult. I wrote a lot of letters. Um, and, uh, Over a hundred letters, yeah, I believe. Yeah, a hundred letters, yeah. And, and in fact, I got three answers. Which is, you know, bottom terrible, terrible today, return rate. It, when I was the head of design, I ensured that we answered people within a week. And even kids of eight years old and so on, because it was abominable. Uh, so, uh, so in fact, uh, three companies were interested. Turned out one was, they didn't tell me, but they invited me, uh, and in fact, it was to translate, which was not exactly my, my thing. Um, and um, I got an offer from Raymond Lowy in Paris, but I basically I had to choose between having a roof or being able to feed myself. And then the other company was Simca, which was a French manufacturer. And they offered me a salary, which meant that I could actually live somewhere with a roof and, and feed myself. So the choice was kind of <coughs> made very easily. And then you spent a few years there before moving on? Very shortly. Okay. Very short. Very, very short. Actually. Very short. And before you went to Ford? Yeah. One of the things which doesn't appear too, too often, but is I, I spent a few uh, months in Simca. And there, there was an American designer who taught me an enormous amount. He was a, one of the former Mustang uh, designers, and he, uh, we didn't have that much work. And he, uh, he was like a teacher to me, and I progressed and began doing things that weren't used, you know, weren't uh, uh, already in, uh, used by French designers or European designers. And one of the first guys to use uh, acrylic paint, and he used, always made huge illustrations. So I learned all this thing, and we elected to uh, go out of the back door and uh, create a company which we called Style International. Um, and uh, we offered our services to Simca, mm -hmm. which was just a mad, mad thing. And we actually did win one car, which was Simca 1000 um, prototype. It, was, it went all the way to actually being photographed as a, as a vehicle. And then um, um, there was May 1968, and that was the Students' Revolt, when one of the men is in France. So, uh, and, um, and, and we lost all our business, so I had to look for a job. And so I applied, um, I, I applied to Ford and General Motors. And Ford replied very quickly. And they replied okay. because they had lost 16 designers to uh, what? became uh, well, what was British Motor Corporation. And the, the design center was here in Birmingham. And so I was offered a job immediately. And so I flew over and uh, I was hired immediately. Um, before we move on to, to what you were doing at Ford, you, you've touched on a couple of different things. Um, first of all, you said that you're, you're a missionary. Mm -hmm. But would you also describe yourself as a creative? Well, very much so. I think so. Uh, there you are, being bold. But yes, yeah, absolutely. I've been uh, fascinated by, by crea creativity. I've been uh, very much involved for myself, but in groups, in creating the conditions for people to, uh, uh, to be more creative, the environment being extremely important. Um, and uh, yes, I, I, I feel that all my life has been associated with, uh, with creativity. Very much involved, yes. So, when you were at Ford, uh, we touched upon this personally earlier when we were talking, um, but you didn't go straight away and work solely on cars, did you? Tell us a bit about what you were doing at Ford. 
Uh, well, at at at, um, at four, at the beginning, I was uh, I was asked to contribute to various designs. Okay, um, and uh, I I always lost. And I was what, what do you mean by that? That you well, lost? namely that I never was I was never chosen. So and I was design. not chosen because this was an interior design, and the chief designer of the time was a man called Uwe Bans. And he, um, uh, we had great conversations. And he liked what I did, but basically I was looked upon as being too advanced. And my projects were never chosen because of that. Um, you know, after a while it got a bit painful. But he uh, uh, then made me an offer to go back to college um, to study for an MBA. So I did. I did that in uh, what is now known as uh, Anglia Ruskin mm -hmm. uh, University. So I I worked part of the week uh, in in the design centre, and the rest of was studying, which meant I studied every weekend, you know, um, because there were some subjects which I was too good. Fortunately, my wife was gradu had graduated in you know in business, so she can help she me out. Me yeah. out. <laughs> And so you ended up working on lorries at Ford? Well, that was much later. Okay. Very later, because I moved from Britain, got a promotion, went to Germany, stayed in Germany for a while, and then for a few years. And then I came back to Britain. And when I came to Britain, then I was in a position, the title was uh, executive of, um, of uh, advance and uh, truck design. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I worked, yes, and I worked on one truck which happens to be one of the two projects that I've, I always quote um, as being the ones that I've been very much, uh, uh, you know, I feel the closest to mm -hmm. and the most challenging. Uh, the Twingo, which we probably will talk about, and this was the Ford Cargo. And one interesting thing about these two projects in both cases, the head, the, the president or whoever, that, that the top person, was somebody who was new in a position of, of uh, overseeing everything, including design. So basically, somebody was, was you know, knew nothing about design, and in each case, uh, managed to sell them a very modern design, um, and had they probably had. A lot of experience, they would never approve them. But the four cargo was, yeah, that was really, uh, uh, I think, a very modern uh, truck. It was elected uh, uh, truck of the year in Europe and it was built for 40 years, yeah. That's a long time. A long time. Yeah. Um, speaking of another car uh, mm -hmm. or, or automobile which has been around for a long time, it is the 30th anniversary of the Renault Twingo. Mm -hmm. So, after spending, was it 17 years? 17 years, yeah. 17 years at Ford, mm -hmm. you, you left, mm -hmm. um, and you spent a time at the Volkswagen Audi group for a couple of years. Yes. And then Renault came calling. But you had applied there several times, am I right? I, in fact, I had applied 11 times. 11 times. <laughs> you are teaching something in perseverance today, absolutely. So this was, was this whilst you were at Ford or during your career you'd applied there several times? All the way through. Okay. Yeah, but I have to say that they were also the ones who didn't reply to me. Uh, I hope you changed that. Please ask me four times. <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah. But um, yes, in fact, I was, I was uh, in the uh, Volkswagen uh, Audi group where I was earmarked to become the first head of the, uh, the, the design for the three, for the, there were only three brands at mm -hmm. the time. So there was Volkswagen, there was Audi, and there was Seat. And um, suddenly I was contacted by, by Renault and saying, you know, uh, the president of the company would really like to, to meet with you. So, um, so you I was surprised. You their eye. Well, let me tell you the story because it's funny. Uh, in, in Renault, the uh, the the head of uh, what was then called styling um, asked for an earlier time because of health reasons. And within the company, being a very very engineer oriented company, they had uh, chosen somebody who was not a designer, 
but he was a, a, an engineer coming from a prestigious school in France called Polytechnique. Uh, you, I tend to say about Polytechnique that they know everything and nothing else. And uh, they, uh, they appointed him, you know, they wanted him to become the head of design. Uh, so everything was going wonderful for this fellow who almost was of course totally qualified because he dressed finally. Um, he, his father was gallery owner and he did caricatures, you know, just think, what do you expect of the designer? So he's just the perfect candidate. Except that the, um, the uh, what do you call that, the director's committee in the signing area, they said they refused, you know, they, they said they're not, okay, they said, all right, we accept each individually that we are not at the right level to become the successor of the current um, director, but uh, we refuse that it should be somebody from either marketing or, or, or engineer. Why don't you go and take a real professional? And that's when my name was uh, uttered. And as a result, they contacted me, you know. Um, and uh, so there I was, and one day I was downstairs, you know, pressing the bell to go and see the president because we didn't meet in his office, but in his home, you know. Mm. So, because of, you know, not being recognized and so on. So, yeah, I pressed the bell and uh, I started talking to him about design. And he said, oh, I, I don't know anything about design. He said, oh, that's not true. He had a fantastic sense of humor. No, not true. He said, I did go to the Paris Fair last year and we, we bought a toilet brush where we were told it was very, very designed. So, and there was a smile on his face. And I, I could see that guy had a really good sense of humor. So, yeah, I, he gave me, you know, a carte blanche, totally free hand. I didn't talk to him about salary because that wasn't my motivation for once to get there. Mm -hmm. But I did say that I would only accept the job as long as uh, this new entity, which I proposed to call design, uh, would be on par with engineering and product planning and not answering to engineering. And uh, he said, absolutely. And that was it. So I joined, you know, yeah, I was ready. And, and speaking about that, almost that, um, we spoke about it a little bit earlier, but about ensuring that, that creative role is as important, um, if not equally important or more important, than maybe more traditional roles and to make sure you have the ability to make decisions. But we'll go on to that okay. in a second. But one of the, when, you, when you were first there, one of your jobs was to, was to kind of relaunch or re, remodel all, like previous editions of cars. Yes. One of which was the Twingo. Became the Twingo. Well, in, in fact, just before I left, I, the Gaston Chouchet, who was the man in charge of styling, uh, maybe really on probably the last two days, you know, in December, I, I was appointed on the, um, this is the 1st of January, uh, 1988, and he gave me two keys. And he said, uh, uh, this is the, the keys where we have two models, proto not models, not prototypes, of a um, entry-level vehicle, which we had proposed, but um, uh, it was um, uh, it was not approved to go ahead because the, the, the cars proved to be not to be uh, economically sound. You know, that, that clearly we were going to lose money, and one must remember that I was joining a company which was close to bankruptcy. Mm, okay. okay. So, uh, as soon as I arrived, I, brought my little two keys and I said, I want to see the cars, you know. So they brought these two, these two models. One was not, I felt not terribly interesting. It had been a car designed by Marcello Gandini, which looked to me like a, an anteater. It was thin and so on. And then there was this little car, which was a one box design. So, you know, one box, one silhouette. It was smaller than what the Twingo uh, was. And in fact, in, in, when I looked at it, I felt it might have been a, a vehicle uh, for city, and in France we have a, a something which I don't think exists in England, and, and uh, it, I don't think it's a great idea, but it's to allow people of 17, before they have their driving license, that they can drive these small, what they call them, what you had. Dangerous. Okay, dangerous, yeah. Um, and um, I thought it was close to that, you know, in terms of feeling. 
you did you wouldn't probably want to go and uh, drive on the auto route, the motorway, you know, with your mm -hmm. family and so on. Um, so the first thing I did is I arranged for a meeting with the with the president, who was uh, uh, Renaud Lévy. He was the one that had given me the assignment to bring back innovation to Renault. That was, you know, the, the carte blanche was that. Mm -hmm. You you have really a totally total free hand. You must make the recommendations for Renault to move from these rather boring cars that we've been making in the past. He was new, right? Mm -hmm. he, he, was, he was not a man from the modern trade. He had been in steel and something else. Um, and he came to Renault when the president was uh, assassinated by a um, left-wing um, uh, group. So he had only been there a year. And um, anyway, um, I asked him to come and have a look at the car, and I said to him, I know it has lots of problems associated with cost, but it, I, I think we should give it another go. It's not the right type of car yet. It's too small and so on. It should be made into a mammoth, but it, it's got to increase. And in fact, it was a very interesting car, but it, extremely sad looking. Mm. Interesting enough. And so the car evolved, and we made it just a, a little bit bigger, but I certainly was not one to push for, you know, mammoths, you know, gigantic cars, not at all. It just had to be right, um, with an interesting concept on the interior. We didn't, we weren't close to that yet, but you were the one that it became. But um, he made it about the right size, and I felt happy. And there was a, a, a very uh, a stressful period, because the person who had uh, designed the, the, the car, who had followed on uh, the development, he was the same because, of course, we put him on there. And um, who today, by the way, is the head of Stellantis Design. Um, <coughs> so very clever, one of the best designers I know. But he couldn't come up with a good, a good uh, front end. And I was into this idea that this car had the potential of being something very different, that we should forget about, you know, an aggressive uh, look and that we should go for something radically uh, different. And then one morning I did what I had uh, sort of promised that I wouldn't do. I, I actually did a sketch. The reason why uh, I did this uh, sketch and why I had never wanted to do that is because I had a group of, of designers, mm -hmm. a large group, and I thought in, in a way it was disrespectful, you know, if, you, sketch yourself. if the boss does the drawing, then, you know, what are we, sort of, you know, slaves or whatever, so, um, but this time it was urgent, you know, we were coming to a show, and therefore I did this sketch, and it's a very simple sketch, and it just showed this car from the front with a big smile, and it had eyes, and inside was a fellow with a large grin. And I said, okay, this is what we're going to do, you know, we're going to do a happy car. And in French we call it la voiture du bonheur, the car of happiness. Oh. So it was totally the opposite of what people were looking, you know, serious or whatever. No, that's not, that, was, that was not what we wanted to do. And so we modeled that. And uh, lo and behold, came the time for a major review. Uh, I remember it, it took place, you know, upstairs and the the economics were still not right, you know, and most people felt very sad. Um, but somebody said, well, let's go and have a look at the model, you know, even though it was far from conclusive, it had improved, yeah. but it was not conclusive. So we went downstairs, and there was this model in the show, one model covered, and we took off the cover, and, and the car smiled to the president, and he smiled. <laughs> and I said to him, um, this is not a car, this is a pet. And um, I added that um, in the winter, you know, when you go, you drive home, if it's snowing or the weather is bad, you don't leave it parked on the curbside. You put it under your arm <laughs> and you install it in front of the chimney. And everybody, because I was new in the company, everybody thought I was going to be fired. And I would say some of them stepped back because they didn't want to get blood all over the And the president totally understood. 
you really understood what it's all about. And, um, and the program continued, and we we went on and, um, until we had a, a market research. Well, I just want to take you back a sec, but that was all about giving a car a personality, yeah. wasn't it? Um, is that important to you? Do you? Have you always tried to do that? Essential. Essential. And also, as a designer, you know, I've worked now for well, several companies. <coughs> I never imposed a design, uh, a Patrick Le Quimant signature. Never. There is not. You know, when I was working in uh, in Ford, I was working according to DNA of Ford. When I was in Volkswagen Audi, it was you know Audi, Volkswagen, and Seat. So when I arrived in, in Renault, my the, my first things that I worked on was the, the the company DNA, which was not a question of creating it. It was mm. there, it was just assembling it. Mm. But there was an awful lot of thinking. So, um, a company quite remarkable in terms of its past, you know, that, that um, uh, he had invented, uh, you know, after, if you just look at the after the war, but even before the war, Louis Renault <coughs> in France was known as Mr. 1000 Patents. That's how the creative was. And then um, after the war, um, there was the, the, you know, the, the, the 4L, the Cafel, you know, which was the first car with the tailgate. And then after that, there was the R16, which had this uh, model interior. And then after that, there was the R5. And so on. Then the S-Pass. So it was a highly creative uh, company. And then they had gone into this period of coming out with these extremely boring cars. You know, very, very <laughs> boring, you know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, I was, I was really getting into the history, trying to understand it, and not to, you know, to make sure that I was on course. And there I had an enormous amount of backing from the president. And that's, I, I could talk to you about Renault all day, but I know we have got a, a time limit, but okay. you really did manage to um, convince and get on with the president. I know you became very close. And he took risks on your behalf, I suppose, because there was some negative feedback, I suppose, in some ways on the Twingo. Um, was it polled that 50% of people hated it? Well, they didn't dislike it, they hated it. 50% <laughs> of people yeah. surveyed yeah. hated the Twingo, but... 25% loved it. I mean, not liked it, loved it. And 25% said, yeah, but I certainly wouldn't be the first, I wouldn't want to be the first one in the street. And the, you know, the market research arrived and everybody saw the 50%. And I saw the 25% and I, I asked, I said, well, what is our ambition in terms of market part, you know? And basically, you know, we were in kind of 4%, you know? And we had these 25% of people, I mean, they, they went as far as to say, we will wait until it comes out. But then there was an enormous amount of pressure to change the car and basically, to make a resume of what it was is wipe the smile off that car. You know, make it serious. Make it look serious that people don't look at it as being a joke. You know, um, and um, and so I, I left that meeting. No support. Absolutely not, not. I mean, of course, history is rewritten. You know, like <laughs> Joseph Stalin, you know, we're rushing the people. You know, out, out of photographs. But, but everybody, every, every, today everybody was full, but in fact there was nobody, nobody, nobody. And I went on a long weekend to the south of France, and um, it was before emails, uh, and, and I just wrote a little note to the president. So you know, again, you know, I'm moving, I'm taking a risk, so I'm mm -hmm. sending it directly to the president. But, and I said, you know, the biggest risk for the company is not to take any risk. And I asked him to choose between instinctive design and extinctive marketing. And he wrote back on the note and sent it back. He said, Je suis tout à fait d'accord, mon cher directeur. On y va. So, I'm, I'm completely in agreement with you, my dear director. We'll go. Let's go ahead. And that was it. That was a decision. But not many people would take those risks necessarily. But you knew it was right. You knew in your gut that that was the car you, you wanted to create and you knew it would be a success. Yeah. 
because I knew that, well, I felt that this car, I never, I never um, uh, had, had seen anywhere in my life results as good as that, you know. Just, just one thing, there was, uh, David Ogilvy um, had this fantastic uh, quote. He wrote, um, you know, the agency uh, Ogilvy and Mathis, he said, most companies use market research like a drunkard uses a lamppost, more, more for support rather than illumination. And I think it's absolutely <laughs> true. You know? And so... Uh, you should put that on a t-shirt. Well, so, you should. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, and to, to me, it's so true. So it wasn't, you know, uh, my uh, ego talking. It's just I was convinced it was going to work. And it worked. I mean, the first day I drove in Paris, to the to the, the to the motor show, at the traffic lights, people would stop and they would stop, they would smile, and they said, "What is it?" You know. And when we got to the motor show, it was the biggest success. Oh. That the the, the 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 last one as big as that was the, the launch of the Citroen DS, and we were facing the Peugeot stand, and there were an awful lot of people on the Peugeot stand because they couldn't get on the Renault stand. <laughs> Upstairs to look at the launch. How brilliant! Yeah, and amazing. Mean, we we could talk about that a bit, but I mean, what what are cars for and and design for if it's not to make people smile and make people happy? I mean, I, I wish there was more smiling cars out there. But we we must move on from Renault. Um, but I do want to ask you, as an environmentalist myself, and you mentioned how how you're interested in the environment, is the the rise of electric cars and. And how you see that evolving and, and, and technology also um, kind of pushing the car industry forward? How have, how have you seen it change? I became very much aware of uh, you know, any concerns about the environment, uh, I must say, rather late, because it was in the late 90s. Um, but then I, I went on a trek in, in Brazil and, and saw uh, you know, plastics everywhere. And, um, so, uh, to me, electric cars was going to be a, a play a major role. And in fact, in the concept cars that we we did, we did a whole series of electric cars, which people don't remember too much. But they, um, I'm writing an article on that right now. But anyway, uh, the future, yes, electric cars. The only problem I have with electric cars is the fact that uh, when you come down to it, um, if you produce electricity uh, from a cone burning, coal, coal burning uh, central uh, you know, uh, power station, yeah. then it's it's not that as interesting as it is. You know, you really have to have uh, to, to you know the, the, you source back source back to the producing of electricity. Yeah. This is where it all starts. So it's dangerous when one limits one's look at you you only a very small part. And I'm interested in you know in the big in the bigger picture basically. Absolutely. And but before we move past cars, I want to ask you a very important question. If you were a car, what would you be, Patrick? Oh, I'm afraid I'd still be a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> Not electric, and arguably doesn't have a smile, but <laughs> makes you smile clearly. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Full of contradictions. <laughs> You still have to go with that heart though, you know, yeah. <laughs> what if it was like inside? Um, I, so you spent, I mean, over 50 years working yeah. in, the, in the car industry, and now mm. you've moved to boats. Mm. Tell mm. us about that, and, and, and you spent about 15 years now working with yachts and boats. 13, 13 years. 13 years. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, um, I left Renault, I'll say very quite, I retired, <laughs> um, but I, I didn't want to, as I said, you know, I didn't, didn't want to spend the rest of my life just cycling or learning to knit or whatever. So, I, I, what I wanted to do was, I wanted to do something new. Mm. I didn't want to be what some call a trophy designer, where they use your name and so on. And so I wanted to go into, into doing something where I knew nothing. I wanted to become an apprentice again. I didn't choose the... Um, I didn't choose uh, boats. I am not a sailor. I'm not no. Not a seafaring uh, person. It, generally. it chose me, but but just out of luck. You know, basically, I when I left the company, I was contacted to help out 
uh, a large group boat, building boats to help them improve their sea quality because I was also a corporate uh, senior vice president of quality in Renault for a few years. And, uh, and I said, yes, oh, I'll, I'll help you out. And then I did my job, I introduced processes and so on. And then they said, uh, you know, would you be interested to design the ne our next animal ship? And I said, I know nothing about boats. He said, well, don't worry, you'll be in a good team and, and they'll help you out. And, uh, and so, yeah, I designed, uh, I did the exterior design of this boat. It, it was multi hull of the year in the United States, European boat of the year. And then, you know, that was my first boat and it was a catamaran and then I had a second and a third and a fourth and so on. It just went on. It just went on forever. And it shows you like a challenge. Do you, do you have a boat yourself? No, no, no. Just the cars? No, no. But, uh, my original family comes from Brittany and uh, people, the boat on, you know, we never get seasick. And, and, and no, I, I suffer from earth sickness, but not seasickness. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, to round off, this wonderful chat. I mean, there's so many areas we, we, we haven't been able to touch on, and Patrick will be around for 20 minutes or so after this downstairs if you do have any questions. But we're here back at Bowman's University. You have worked across so many different cars, so many different design processes, learned a lot, you're a creative, you're a missionary. What is one of the key pieces of advice that you would, you would give to people, I suppose, in their career, whatever that career is? But we've spoken about resilience and perseverance. What is what is the one thing that you would advise to, to, to be able to keep going? Well, I think it's um, try always to look beyond the horizon, namely not to con concentrate your sight on something which is close, namely open your eyes to the outside world. And this is something which uh, I, I've pushed with my, my designers. I found that some of my designers when I made a reference to, I remember the name, Ross Lovegrove, they didn't know who he was, you know. And, and so I, I, I pushed them to go and look out, you know, and I sent them on transmission to go in, in, in places like Milan. So my, my thing is looking out. Ne never, never um, just uh, becoming a specialist of a specialist, you know. It's really looking out, broadening your look, and accepting the influences from everywhere. And I love international teams, for example, because it broadens. Uh, and I had a team of 29 nationalities. And it was not accident, because it's necessary to open out and have all these influences from the rest of them. And it also stops you from being arrogant, be it an arrogant British or an arrogant French. Very important. <laughs> Very important indeed. Um, well, Patrick. You, you are a missionary, you are creative, and you are responsible for over 60 million cars. Yes. I want to say a huge thank you for being with us today. Patrick Le Camon, thank you so much, everyone.